Hello and welcome to Scene Partner, a new show where I interview a whole load of different performers and creative professionals. This week I am joined by Xander Black, a actor, singer, children's entertainer and role player. So please welcome Xander Black. Thanks Hello Xander. How are you? I'm very good and it's good to have you. Now, in my intro, I did what I find I'm doing for a lot of guests. I am reeling off a whole load of job descriptions. I'm reeling off a load of different titles. So I find it best to ask everybody, if you meet somebody brand new and they don't know you, they don't know what you do, how do you describe your job to them? I'd say an all-rounder, um, a jack of all trades, because like you say, most of us have to do many different jobs. Um, I probably would talk more about the children's entertaining more, um, but people also find a lot of interest in being a fire breather, which is one of the other jobs that I do. Um, but I mean, all rounder is, is probably the simple answer on it. I think a lot of us have to be, you know, one once upon a time, it might have been okay to be a dancer alone. Mm -hmm. These days you have to be an actor, dancer, singer, and it seems triple threat is no longer enough. It, needs to be so much more. Yeah, I mean, um, it's quadruple and quintuple threat now because when I was getting near the end of my training, it was you need to also know a musical instrument. Mm. And now it's you need to learn all of those things and have another skill on top. You've got to have so many different abilities um, just to get through the door nowadays. Yeah. I noticed a casting went out the other day that was exactly that. You have to be a an actor musician you have to be a, an actor this uh well talking then you briefly sort of made a nod to when you were starting out mm. could you tell us a little bit about your journey to get into the industry where you started and, and how you got to where you are now yeah i mean i started i'd say from the age of seven when i watched the movie greece and i wanted to be danny zuko um i wanted to do the singing and the dancing um, then at the age of eight, I was introduced as such to, uh, it was a modeling agency local to me and went for it and they put us in touch with a dance school and then I did dancing and like local youth theatre, local um, theatres, uh, the school musicals as we all do, uh, at the age of 18 when I then went to uh, Lane Theatre Arts. Uh, did their musical theatre course for a year. I then had an injury, which meant I couldn't continue. So then I went to East 15 Acting School and their pioneering course, as they called it, uh, Community Theatre, uh, where I learned my other skills like children's entertaining and workshops, but also circus skills and the fire breathing. And then that led to the career. You mentioned there that you had an agent. Do you still have an agent now? Do you think it's important to have an agent in this industry? Well, when I was eight, it was one of those someone, I think a mum with a computer at the time that knew a couple of people. Um, I didn't go with the agency there. And the only times I've had, I think an agent has only ever gotten me one job in the whole of my career. I've had numerous different agents, um, but I've still got my own work. Um, when I do equity chats at drama schools and things like that, the I say that the agent, as we all know, is working for you. But the majority of agents that are out there, have I got the exact same contacts you've got? It's only worth going to an agent if they're seeing the jobs on, let's say, Spotlight that are at the next tier up because you can find all those other jobs and you're giving them 10, 12, 15% just because you aren't spending that time finding the job. Mm. And so then without agents, how do you find most of your work? Do you create most of your work or are you getting it through other means? Um, I mean, most of my work originally was through Casting Call Pro or Mandy as it's known now, or I would get it through the stage, the uh, newspaper when it had, the jobs section that was really easy to get into. Um, so for the first few years, it was all through that. Then after the first five years, it was all word of mouth, really. Um, Facebook's actually more recently got me a lot more work. Um, so, and yeah, people will work with people that they know of or will put people in touch with people they know of in terms of work. Um, I mean, like you said in the intro, my uh, role playing, 
I got that um, and most of my work through role playing from an equity friend of mine who said, "Are you available tomorrow in Bristol?" I said yes. Got contact by the company, got registered with the company within an hour, and then was working for them the next day at eight twenty in the morning. And that's sometimes how it works. That when people are having a crisis, they'll contact people who are on their books. And if you happen to be fortunate, then you're straight in. Yeah, I've had a similar experience. I was working in a in a non ordinary job, and I had a friend contact me, and out of that, I got two tours and. I owe them an awful lot because it was at a period it needed to be. Yeah, when you're doing those muggle jobs, it's always good to make the contacts. Yeah, definitely. So looking at looking at my notes here and, and looking at the type of things that I did in research, one of the things that I asked you in, in my research was to, to see whether or not you had any memorable shows or any shows that meant a lot to you. Uh, you answered in particular one one that I found quite interesting was about the show that meant a lot to you. Would you uh, expand on that a little? Um, I think I put the, the two answers. I think I put down the one which was when I was eleven years old was Wind in the Willows mm. um, when I got to play Toad uh, and Toad of Toad Hall. Um, it meant a lot because it was actually my first time a being a lead, um, which as a character actor, even from a young age playing the lead is very, very rare. Um, uh, I also had my first uh, time of wearing padding uh, because I had to look more like a toad. So I had like padding all the way around the top half of my body to make sure I looked more like a toad. Fun. Um, I, oh, great fun. I sweated a lot in that. <laughs> it, it was kind of my first introduction into what life will be like being a dame because I had green face paint all over me. I had padding all around my body and I was wearing weird trousers to make my legs look thinner. So it was, it was definitely the first opportunity where I wore a costume to alter the way I looked, um, ready for a role. And with Panto, it's definitely the same again. I, I do that pretty much every single Christmas. Yeah. Uh, it's a costume creates so much of the character sometimes, I think. It does. I mean, I think it was, was it Judy Dench that said that when she's found the shoes, she's found the rest of the character in that kind of uh, uh, better wording. I, I can't remember exactly, but, and it is true. I mean, speaking of shoes, um, I did Panto at Christmas. There was an outfit and all the pairs of shoes I had just didn't work. And I was like, Mrs. Pans would not wear these shoes with this outfit. So I had to buy another pair of shoes, which was another 20 something quid down but they're beautiful they're tartan and they're gorgeous mm. but it had to be done because why as a person you wouldn't wear something as you go out in the street that you don't really feel comfortable in so why would a character do the same mm. i remember when i was training one of the things that happened was for the first year's performance, the director all of a sudden, after a couple of weeks of rehearsal, went right. You're all you're all going barefoot because the shoes you've got are all different, which completely threw me yeah. internally. It made me scream because like we, we we haven't rehearsed that, and that's yeah. It just sort of you know drama school floors not exactly clean. <laughs> they never are. They never <laughs> are. And then there's the you can roll around in it as well. It's yeah, it's all glamour. This industry, I tell you. It is, especially when you have to do like an Alexander class or something like that, and you're lying down in it. They say, like, really sink into the floor, and you're like, I'm sinking into so much dirt at this moment in time. But okay, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> well, moving on then, you having looked at various jobs you've done and, and what's available publicly, shall we say, on, on your CVs, it looks like you've done quite a bit of touring work. Yeah. Uh, I wonder whether you could tell us what whether you think there's much difference between touring work and and shows that happen in fixed locations um i think it depends on the location you go into i mean i find with touring work the audience feel more ownership of the production example being if you do a touring panto or a touring tie theater education piece and you go into a school the kids know that space they know it a lot stronger than they know a theater so as such, when they want to cheer or they want to boo or they want to get involved, they'll do it more readily than they would do in a theatre. Um, whereas if you take a theatre production, there, there is more theatre etiquette 
that is observed or is at least trying to be observed whilst you're in there. I prefer going into other people's space. I mean, it goes back to the community theatre that I did at East 15. Instead of taking people to the theatre, the theatre comes to you. And it, it, it does create a whole new atmosphere that you wouldn't get anywhere else. And I know there's touring theatres where you go from theatre to theatre to theatre. And again, different areas give you different things and different environments and different reactions. But going out of a theatre space is quite interesting in a different way. Mm. Are there any specific challenges, do you think, to touring theatre that maybe uh, shows in fixed locations don't have? Any particular challenges? Yeah, so not last year, but the two years before that, I toured for a theatre company and we were going to schools. And the, there's one school that I remember very strongly where... Basically, to get into the hall, you, you go in through the main entrance and you're straight away into the hall. And they say, okay, you need to set up this end because all the kids, majority of them, come through this way. And you're like, okay, you say majority of the kids. You're like, well, yeah, year five are going to be behind you. So they've got to come through the backstage area before the show starts to then go sit down. And I'm like, okay, but there were people changing behind there. And so basically we would hide the characters that need to be hidden, such as your dame, your baddie, um, and people like that, and they would all go into the disabled toilet, and then year five would come through, they'd sit down, and then you'd all come back out. And then if you had any quick changes where, and especially for young ladies who would need to get changed from one complete outfit to another, you then have to go into the disabled blue. And if you had a really, really quick change, then you've got to make sure that there's people holding the door to then open it again because you need to keep your DBS. Yeah, it's I've, having done similar shows to that. It's uh, it's a challenge when you're just presented with a space and you think, okay, how are we going to make this work? Uh, change facilities. Yeah, you get those venues where you you turn up and the theater, the theatre company have already said to the venue, to the, the school, or to the social club. This is how much space we need to do the show. And then they give you half the space. And they've promised the theatre company that this, you've got all the space. That's all fake. That's all great. And then you actually get in there and you're like, no, nah, we can't do the dance routine. And on the fly, you are cutting sections, but then expanding other sections because you can do those for longer. And they're paid for an hour 45 show with 15 minute break. And if you don't do that, they will then demand a refund. Yeah. So changing the show for the bits that you need to take out and then putting new bits in on the fly, which is when you hope that people are able to improvise with you when you go, right, this scene needs to last five minutes, not two. Go. <laughs> it's it's a big challenge, I think, sometimes to do a touring theatre when you don't know what you're walking into. With that in mind, do you have do you have any advice for somebody who might be going out into that kind of touring theatre world who might not have experienced it before i mean for living in the van as much as you are make sure you take your vitamins and minerals your vitamin c because you're going to get ill and at this moment in time with illnesses going around you can't keep two meter distance there's a, a mem going around at the moment with the two meter distancing of the pantomime cow at the moment which is interesting um but the best advice i can give you is People have personalities, respect their personality, respect their choices, but make sure they respect yours. Um, I think respect is a huge, huge thing. And some people, like I, I did a production where I was not seen as the prince by the person playing the princess because she had in her mindset what the prince should look like. And I was not that. Mm. And it made it very difficult for the two of us to get on. So you've got to respect that another person's been brought in because they're bringing a certain something to this production. And it's your job to try and find that and respect the personality that they're bringing as well and respect that the personalities don't come on stage because you've got to be professional with yeah. it. You can work with someone that you really, really, really get on with and that makes the tour so much better. But 
sometimes you will be touring with someone you really would never spend personal time with for three, five, eight months. And you've got to come to terms with that. Yeah. I found on one of my one of my tours, I ended up going for long walks after rehearsals and after shows because that was a way I could clear my head and be on my own because you don't get a lot of space on your own. No, and as well, that's part of it as well, that you've got to be respectful that when people want their own space, let them have it. Yeah. I mean, there, there are times like you'll do it. We, when I did one tour, we were all watching, because um, it was just coming out, Sherlock, with Benedict mm. Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman. We were, we were all watching that in the evening after we'd done two or three shows in the log cabin. But there were some people that just weren't. And that's not because they didn't want to be part of the team or they didn't want to be involved. It's just that they needed their personal space. And you've just got to respect that and let them have that. Definitely. So one of my reasons for starting this show was, and I don't know whether you've experienced this, you get a couple of actors together or a couple of performers together or people from our industry, whether that be in a pub or in a green room or wherever, you get a load of interesting stories and, and, and you hear about all those moments that ordinary people who aren't in this industry would just go, wait, you did what? Yeah. And one of the things during research that came up is that you said one of those moments for you was fire breathing in the middle of a high street. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Um, so on the community theatre course I was doing at East 15, um, a guy called Damien, um, from Wales, he taught us how to do fire breathing. And then we were to do the turning on of the Christmas lights in South End on Sea. So basically, um, a section of the main high street was cornered off for us. And we were doing six of us, no, six, seven of us were doing fire breathing in the middle of the high street. I was also doing fire staff and Interesting story. I don't know if I put this on the questionnaire, but interesting story was I wore the wrong type of trousers when I was doing it because I'm very new to it still. Everyone else was wearing jeans and I was wearing this. I think it must have been like nylon cargo pants mesh type thing. And I was going around with the fire staff. It brushed against my leg, thought nothing of it. And then suddenly about two seconds later, I'm feeling sand being thrown at me because my leg was on fire. And the reaction from the audience was hilarious. And then I just shrugged my shoulders and carried on as if nothing had happened. And then the next time I came out with the fire staff in that section, because I had to redouse it quickly, um, I accidentally hit myself near the crotch area and everyone was like, ooh, because they were expecting that to set a light. And luckily, I hadn't made enough contact to set that on fire. It sounds quite a, quite a risky moment, but still... <laughs> Not everybody gets to have stories like that. That's that's part of the interesting thing about this industry, I think. I think if you haven't got interesting stories from this industry, you've not been taking enough risks. <laughs> that's a that's an interesting way of looking at it. Because uh, the, there is that element of you don't know what's going to pay off, I suppose. No, and sometimes actually from taking a risk and a gamble, you actually make, you make something which would never have happened in any other way and make a progress, a progression that couldn't have occurred i mean it wasn't until i first thought about i don't know using my martial arts skills with fire that i then went to the fire staff because I, I trained as a martial artist for three four years during childhood and always got well i grew up on things like the karate kid and daniel san so me getting a stick and spinning it around with fire at the end of it was just mixing two skills together and it broke up a show which was mainly drumming fire breathing that was it whereas we could then put in a bit of fire staff also people brought in fire poi because of the skills going that way so by taking a gamble we created more of a show out of it now of course incredible and unbelievable moments don't always don't end at the single thing. And I've heard you before saying things like, "You might know me as the guy who's married to a mermaid." <laughs> Would you expand on that for us? Okay, so some of you in the background might be able to see uh, the. Yep, that's it there. Um, so my wife is mermaid Mer Shell. Um, she's a professional mermaid and has a gorgeous three and a half stone tail. 
Um, we do children's parties. Uh, it all comes about because when Michelle was younger, she wanted to meet slash be a mermaid. She loved the little mermaid and Ariel and really, really, really wanted to become a mermaid. Then a few years before we got together, she got told by a friend about being a professional mermaid, bought a tail. She then um, did numerous different things, including there's a Channel 4 documentary under the bracket, I think it's My Weird Hobby, which I think was sold to her as My Incredible Life or something like that, but My Weird Hobby. And it's the first episode called The Mermaid, where it was the unboxing of her tail from America, um, it being brought over and her training as a free diver to be able to swim underwater. And from one point when we were dating, she was to do a hosting job. I think it was at Bracknell Theatre. Um, it was for Songs of the Sea. And she thought she was going there as a host. But actually, she was going there as a host mermaid. And I was in London at the time where she was living. And basically, I got told, I need my tail. And I said, OK, I need to get it to you. And she's like, yeah, but from there, I've got to go straight to the theatre. It's like, great, who's going to move you when you're there? And she went, ah. And so then from that moment on, I then went. Uh, she was working at a ship at the time in London. Um, so she had like a cabin boy outfit with her. So I put it on when we were going onto the stage. She was there at the start on a chaise long. And basically, I then just started doing this really bad West Country accent, just going, would you like to have a shelfie with the mermaid? <laughs> and that was the birth of Pirate Pete, who was my comedy character. Hey, son, you're all right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was the basis of um, Pirate Pete and Mermaid Merchel. Amazing, amazing, and we've got a little uh, sort of promo section because there's uh, you've got a there's the mermazing pirate adventure I think it's called uh, yeah. which we'll we'll hear about shortly. But before we do, uh, one of the things I came up with for this show because I'm heavily inspired by some very very great interview and chat shows that have happened out there uh, is a is a short questionnaire, a quick fire questionnaire of six questions. Okay, so I'm asking this of everybody who comes on the show. Don't worry about thinking about the answers too much. Uh, let's see. Let's see how your response up. So we start with, what is your favourite type of entertainment? Panto and farce. And what's your least favourite type of entertainment? I think I would go with either mime or. Um, the contemporary artsy stuff. And I think we mm. all know what that means. <laughs> uh, what trait do you think is most valuable to a performer? The ability to play. And what trait do you most value in a castmate, colleague or collaborator? Making mistakes. Mm. And being with it. And if you could learn one new skill, what would the new skill be? Um... Other than being able to talk less, I think it would probably be playing the piano. And what one thing would you like to see change most about the industry? I would say breaking the class ceiling or just equality in general, that we have opportunities from those, especially from a working class background, to do the things that people from a non-working class backgrounds have taken much easily to them people from the working class background some very interesting answers there and i would love to ask you more about them but uh we'll we'll stay on track for now uh as i said we've got this uh promo lined up to to show people would you like to tell us a bit about um, amazing pirate adventure so, An Amazing Pirate Adventure is a piece that was written by my wife, Michelle. Um, it was then put through research and development with Elite Productions um, with our good friend Elliot Clark. Um, it was then... Original songs were then made. Uh, it did a previews tour last year, and then this year was going to be the full tour uh, going to many different venues and then of course corona happened and the whole tour got cancelled 
Well, here it is. Here is a clip from the from that show. I'll play that for us now. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Come and join us for an amazing pirate adventure. Oh, 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 tell them about the magic. Oh, there's going to be so much magic. Oh, oh, tell them about the singing. Oh, there's going to be songs and there's going to be dancing and singing <laughs> and it's going to be so much fun. So if you're up for a fantastic time, come and see us at the amazing pirate adventure. Amazing. It was really good. It was really, really great and fun for like all. Like actually, I think I heard plenty of adults laughing, which is which is good as well. <laughs> Over there. No, no, no. It's the So join me, Mermaid Michelle, and me, Pirate Pete, for, for an amazing, amazing pirate adventure! adventure. <laughs> I thought it was amazing. Amazing. That is fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, Xander. Thanks and for having me. Well, before we say goodbye, is there anything else that you'd like to plug or anywhere that people could look uh, to find out more about the show? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can check out Elite Productions' website. Oh, there it is, lovingly across the bottom. <laughs> uh, just going on there. Uh, keep an eye out because the tour has been rescheduled to next year. And hopefully we'll be coming to as many venues as possible. Um, so come along and have a watch. Well, again, thank you very much for joining me, Xander. And for everybody else, a uh, reminder, you can find out more about this show at offbook.co.uk, where we'll be putting the show out. And uh, do please, if you've enjoyed uh, the show, choose to like and subscribe the video on YouTube. That would really help us. And feel free to share it with anybody you, might, you think might find it interesting. For now, though, thank you very much for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye.